Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ohio Energy Project's Careers in Energy Virtual Field Trip. My name is Kelsey Beach. I'm an education coordinator here at Ohio Energy Project, and I'm going to be your moderator for today's field trip. Today, we are excited to be touring One Energy in Findlay, Ohio. We are going to explore wind energy and how it's harnessed and transformed into electricity. And we're also going to explore some career opportunities in the rapidly growing wind industry. So before we get started, um, we are so excited to have you here with us and want to welcome all of the classrooms who are joining us virtually. Um, a few housekeeping items. If you do have questions during our trip, you can post those in the Q&A box on Zoom, um, not in the chat box. So if you do have a question, we will try to get those answered for you throughout our trip. Um, if you are joining us via YouTube, there's no live chat there. So if you do have a question, um, you can go back to that original email that we sent from Ohio Energy and join via Zoom with the link provided and you can ask questions that way. So again, if you are on Zoom, please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A box. All right, so before we get started, we want to thank our um, sponsors for this program. So thanks to the AEP Foundation for hosting the Careers in Energy program. And we also want to thank One Energy for participating and helping us reach so many students and schools throughout the state of Ohio. Um, at our last peak, we had about over 170 classrooms joining us today. So we are super excited about that. Um, before introducing our host, I do want to share a little bit of background information about One Energy. So One Energy is an industrial power company whose headquarters are in Finley, Ohio, at the North Finley Wind Campus. One Energy provides solutions for large electricity consumers looking to reduce their manufacturing plant's utility payments. Wind turbines are installed directly on sites to power industrial facilities and offset their electricity consumption from the grid. So with that in mind, I want to in introduce our host today. He is One Energy's field engineer, Duncan Penazoto. Duncan is going to show us around One Energy, taking us inside the headquarters and outside to check out the wind turbines. And he's gonna be discussing his educational background and current job responsibilities. So we are going to turn it over to Duncan and he's gonna start um, inside One Energy headquarters talking a little bit about what we're seeing um, and introducing himself. So Duncan, go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you so much, Kelsey. Uh, as she said, my name is Duncan Penazato. I'm a field engineer here at One Energy. Uh, my educational background is actually computer engineering um, at the University of Pittsburgh. I graduated about a year ago at this point. Um, and then in my day-to-day -day responsibilities here as a field engineer, I do all sorts of things. Uh, sometimes I deal with data in our analytics group where I'm trying to find out prices of electricity and uh, future prices of natural gas, things like that. Some days I'm out driving a skid steer with the construction team, helping them load and unload trucks. And then some days I'm dealing with our LIDAR units, which we use to measure wind uh, all the way up to 260 feet up in the air uh, just from the ground. So my responsibilities here are pretty varied, which is what I love about the job. And I get to use my computer engineering background um, still every day anyways. So starting your tour around the building, uh, if you look behind me right now, you'll see our SCADA wall. Um, our SCADA wall essentially helps us monitor all of our projects uh, from right here in our office. They're uh, located all around Northwest Ohio, but these monitors give us a very clear view into all of the projects. So we can see their uh, production right now in terms of how much energy they're producing. We can see the wind speeds at them. We can see their operational mode. Uh, it's a really good summary for us to see all of our projects, basically. We can also download all of this data and transform it in any way we need to, um, to essentially get a history of what the project has done as well. Um, if you look at the top row of monitors as well, you'll see part of our weather wall, which helps us monitor weather events in the area. Um, so if there's any extreme events going on, like high wind speeds or low wind speeds or icing, we know to turn off our turbines to make sure everything is safe, healthy, um, and that we can keep these turbines running perfectly for as long as we can. Awesome. Thank you so much, Duncan. So like I said, Duncan's going to show us around today. So as we are going to transition outside to look at the wind turbine blades that are on the ground, we are going to hear from Emily, who is a technician at One Energy. Um, I'm Emily Gerber. I'm a technician at One Energy. Um, so technician at One Energy means we are in the field from anything to building uh, the foundations to actually getting the towers to run full time. Um, daily, 
We start our mornings with a stretch and bend and a JSA, talk about all of our safety, get everything planned. Um, and then we disperse out into the field and whatever needs done, we bust it out. Um, as far as when there's an actual project, we kind of have little groups. Um, Carrie and Justin are part of electrical. I'm the part of the erection crew. So we set out all the components of the wind turbine and then we get the cranes up and stack the tower from base to blade. Um, it's a great place to work because every day you can have a new problem where you have to find a new situ solution to it um, or you know you do so many different aspects whether I'm moving into electrical or other technicians are moving into my realm. Um, it's kind of a melting pot of so many different activities and each day is a little bit of something new. You learn so many different things, um, a lot of problem solving. You really get thrown problems and one energy really leaves it up to you to solve it. There's no like cut and dry board you have to follow. Um, it's pretty much just how you want to solve it. If it works, great. If not, back to the drawing board. Um, we're pretty open with looking at new ways to reinvent things. Um, we're all about innovation, so whatever you can bring to the table, we will look at. So for students, the main thing, um, really good communication. Um, think about how to communicate a problem to someone effectively so that they can get a solution that works for the both of you. Um, communication, hands-on. Anything hands-on you can learn and do now, do it. Um, even if you don't like it a whole lot, it really builds up your skills and helps you just grow into that. Um, and then enthusiasm, we really like it when people come out and are just really excited to get going and get their hands on anything and just work outside and be around us. So communication, skill building, hands-on. So advice for future workers. Um, my advice is really, it's never too late to change something. Um, if you have a set path, you are in control of that and you can literally go whichever way you want to. There is no set direction for you. So you can make whatever way you want to go. Um, with that being said, find something you love and just go for it. Okay, thank you, Emily, for that video and it looks like Duncan is out in the yard area now and he is going to show us a turbine blade and talk a little bit about what we're seeing there. So Duncan, take it away. All right, thank you. Yeah, so behind me we have some of our turbine blades stocked in the yard. Uh, we keep these turbine blades stocked in the yard because they can have very long lead times sometimes. Um, so essentially we keep them here so that our construction process can go faster because the manufacturing process can take a while sometimes. Uh, these blades are also about 150 feet long, so very, very long, but they are pretty flexible. So even I can actually wiggle this blade, which you can see. So while, as I said, they are pretty long, they're very flexible, and that's partially because they're made of fiberglass and balsa wood. The flexibility allows them to uh, uh, basically catch wind better as they're rotating in the air. And as you can see, too, the shape of the blade is curved as well. Um, this helps them, again, rotate. <laughs> this helps them rotate as they're uh, on top of the turbine. Duncan, why are there um, three blades on the turbine? Is there a specific reason for that? Yeah, so there's three blades on the turbine because it's basically the most efficient choice. There could be two blades or even one blade, but they catch the wind less efficiently than three blades. And more blades than that just becomes a big... Uh, expense and just a lot more construction that you have to do for not huge gains in efficiency. Got it. Okay. Well, it looks like we have a couple of questions. So um, we have a question from Madison. She wants to know a little bit about how, how do you get the blades to the top of the turbine? What's the process there since they're pretty massive and. Yeah. So getting the blades at the top of the turbine takes a lot of teamwork across uh, our entire construction department because as I said and as you notice they are huge um, so we actually use a crane to lift uh, the whole hub which or the whole rotor excuse me which is the hub and three blades all the way up to the top of the turbine this is a very intense process we make sure to do everything extremely safely because we're lifting thousands and thousands of pounds up in the air um, but it's all done all three are done at once and then we have people up there waiting to uh, attach it all to the nacelle and the generator okay. And then how long are the blades? 
Uh, the blades are oh, over 150 feet long, so they're quite long. Okay, and another question, this is from Bi the Biomed Academy. Um, depending on the project, do you know anything about the budgets for the projects or how that process works? Uh, the budgets for the projects, it will change depending on project. Um, so I can't speak to too many specifics there. Um, it really depends on a lot of the construction process, a lot of the planning process. Great. And let's see, we've got a couple more. So we'll take a few more before we move on. Um, Christine wants to know, do wind turbines withstand hurricanes or high wind speeds? If so, do they gather additional energy? So they withstand as in they will be present during a hurricane, but we actually uh, have a cut off speed. So we essentially pitch the blades that they purposefully do not catch winds during those high wind events. That keeps them basically healthy longer so that they can keep spinning in normal operating conditions longer. Okay. And Douglas would like to know, is there a max output of each wind turbine? Yep. So each wind turbine does have a maximum power output and that will change across turbines, but our turbines here are 1.5 megawatts. Um, so when they reach their rated speed, that's how much power they'll be producing. Okay. And then our final question is from by the Biomed Academy. Uh, what happens? Has a blade ever come loose, fallen off? Um, so we've never had that happen, thankfully. Uh, we try to be as safe as possible, so no blades are doing anything unexpected like that. Um, we make sure everything is tip-top shape. Uh, we go through inspections very frequently here. Okay, great. Thank you, Duncan. Yeah, so no now we're going to transition to the base of the wind turbine. And while Duncan is moving there, we are going to hear from Brandon. He is One Energy's field design manager. Hi, I'm Brandon Ewing. I'm a field design manager here at One Energy. I um, do basically anything from, typically uh, I would do drafting uh, for, from updating current projects that we may be working on to future uh, preliminary projects that we're looking to get into. Uh, typically it's, I use AutoCAD Civil 3D, do any kind of uh, civil work through that uh, all the way from doing access roads to collection lines uh, building services to get topographic uh, information that we may need to do those designs. Training wise, um, I basically kind of got started with all the AutoCAD. Uh, I got in interested in that in high school. I went into Millstream here in Finley uh, during my junior and senior year of high school. Uh, did that basically half days um, through both my junior and senior year. I really f enjoyed the AutoCAD part of it and that's what got me uh, interested in going into that and in, into college and focusing that as one of my majors because um, I studied uh, construction operations in the technology department and also got into the civil engineering side of that with uh, project management, uh, surveying, and some different estimating and, and such classes. Uh, I would say the one big thing is just uh, being open to new ideas and um, there's always something new to learn each and every day. Uh, even now, I feel like I learn every day learning something new that I didn't know before and just being open to uh, your peers and your coworkers or teammates, classmates, uh, just uh, being willing to try new things. If, if you're interested in doing any kind of like uh, drafting or design of uh, surveying, um, my biggest thing would be to see if you can get involved in your local school district if they have anything. Uh, like here in Finley, we have the Millstream Vocational uh, for juniors and seniors in high school. Um, that gives you a good um, place that you can see if that's what you really want to do and you're not going into college not knowing what you want to do. Um, that was my big fear of not knowing what I wanted to do and this, I'm glad I did that. And just uh, uh, do some job shadowing is awesome. Uh, I think that's huge. Um, Obviously, you can't do any internships really uh, until you're into college, but uh, just that job shadow aspect of just to kind of feel out what it actually is, the day-to-day -day, um, routine of, of what you're interested in and what others do, I feel like that really grows your opportunity to what you want to focus on in life and get excited about each and every day to get out of bed to go to work. All right. 
So now Duncan is going to show you the interior of the wind turbine and talk a little bit about that. So Duncan, we look forward to seeing what's in there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll get there in just a minute, but right now we are on the uh, outside of the turbine. We are at the base of our tower right now, and behind me you can see our megawatt scholarship recipients for this turbine. Uh, so One Energy is very dedicated to promoting STEM education, so we actually give out $5,000 per year per turbine that we build uh, to a local high school student pursuing a STEM degree. Um, so just to try to help them get uh, basically a head start on their financial future in STEM, we think that's really important to do, and we think that uh, we can fulfill a certain corporate responsibility by doing so, essentially. Also, if you look down here, you can see these big bolts along the bottom of our tower. These are called anchor bolts, and they extend very deep into our foundation. There's actually 60 around the outside of the tower here and 60 around the inside of the tower. And they basically help keep everything super grounded uh, via the foundation structurally. Um, it helps keep everything basically in place. Um, so, yeah, we can head inside the turbine now. Okay, great. And as you're walking in there, Duncan, we do have a couple of questions that relate to that. Um, oh, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what the process is of actually building the tower from the ground up? I know you talked about using the crane to put on the blades, but what about that tower? Yeah, so the tower actually comes in four sections. Um, so what we do is we'll use a crane to put these cabinets in, and I'll talk about these cabinets in a second. And then we slowly build up each four sections of the tower with a crane. So we'll put down the lower section and then lower mid, upper mid, and then finally that upper section. And we do that all with a crane as well. Um, and so we kind of building it in chunks, making sure everything is good along the way as we are slowly stacking it. Great. And then also, how many turbines do you have? Does One Energy own and operate? Yeah, so we own and operate about 27 turbines, actually exactly 27 turbines across Northwest Ohio. So we have quite a fair chunk. Great. All right. So we are inside the wind turbine now. So do you want to talk about what we're seeing there? Yep. So yeah, this is the inside of a wind turbine, which is pretty cool. Uh, you can actually look straight up through our turbines and see all 80 meters up. That's about 260 feet. And you're actually able to see all the way to the top because of One Energy's hanging decks. So these hanging decks are graded and allow a lot of light through everything, which is very nice for us because we can see all the way to the top of the tower. But it's also very nice for our technicians because they can see people above them, people below them. It helps maintain a certain level of safety there. And honestly, it keeps the light flowing through. So we have a really well-lit environment to do work in. Uh, we actually climb all the way up our towers as well via these ladders right here. So that's climbing 260 feet, which is uh, quite a task that we perform, but uh, it's something that our te technicians have gotten pretty good at. Uh, they also keep safe using this cable right here. Uh, they can basically attach to that, climb all the way up, safety, no problems. Uh, helps keep them, basically helps keep them moving all the time. Uh, we also have our converter cabinets over here. So we have these black cables that bring the power down from the rotor up top and they kind of come into these cabinets. So it'll come down as AC power, alternating current. It'll get transformed into DC power, direct current, and then actually back into AC. That's healthier for our customers to consume because they expect a certain, a certain quality of AC, essentially. Um, so yeah, that's basically the very basics of the electronic system in the tower. Okay, great. So we definitely have quite a few questions. So um, everybody is always interested to see what's going on in there. So. Let's take one from Miriam. She wants to know how many people does it take to put up and build a one wind turbine? Oh, wow. It takes a lot of people to build a turbine. So speaking from just a construction perspective, let alone all the planning. So just a construction perspective, it'll take dozens of people. Uh, we're very concerned about safety. So we need to make sure that people have eyes, double eyes, triple eyes on everything at all the time. Um, it's a very big team, both within our electrical uh, crew, our rigging crew, our civil crew. Everybody has dozens of people, at least. Okay. Um, and then what type of, oops, sorry, my, my computer's turning with all these questions. Wow. All right, so, um, Markia Miller wants to know, are the turbines powered solely by wind or is there an alternate, uh, uh, alternative energy source as well? So our turbines produce power directly from wind. Uh, some of the electronics will stay on from electricity from the grid. So we have these lights in here that are powered by grid electricity and things like that, but they'll only produce electricity from the wind. Okay, great. Um, Christine wants to know, do you know how deep the turbine goes underground when you showed us the, um, the rings around the base? Um, so how deep the foundation goes, I can't say off the top of my head. Um, 
humans, once the tower is built, we actually only go to ground level. There's nothing that we can get to underground, but I can't say how deep the foundation goes, unfortunately. All right. Uh, Miriam also wants to know, how much power do you produce on a, wi on a windy day, typically? Oh, on a windy day, it's hard to say because a windy day could mean a lot of different things depending on if there's a lot of turbines on that site or if there's a few turbines. Um, all we can say is that a lot of wind is going to exponentially increase the amount of power that we produce and lesser wind is going to do less so. Um, how many, I know you said there, that you own and operate 27 turbines. Um, how many would you say are necessary to power, for example, a farm? Is there some, can you speak on that? Uh, yeah, so I can't speak for a farm directly, but we have, for example, uh, three turbines powering the Whirlpool facility right next to us right now. And while we don't power 100% of their uh, consumption, we do power a fair chunk of it. Um, so while I can't speak exactly to a farm necessarily, that's uh, about what a factory would take. Great. Okay. Awesome. Um, we have a couple of people who want to know how fast the blades spin. Okay. Yeah. The blades spin uh, pretty quickly. So um, obviously towards the tips, they're going to spin faster than towards the hub itself, but on the tips, they go uh, over 200 miles per hour. Um, so they are spinning at quite a high speed um, when they're spinning at a, a fully rated power on lower wind days, they're going to be spinning at a slower speed, but at the max, they are going over, uh, going over uh, that speed, which is quite quick. Yeah, great. And then speaking to that, Erica wants to know, what do we do on a day that's not very windy? How do we make energy on a not windy day? Yeah, so on a not windy day, we're unfortunately not making much energy. Um, we actually have the turbines off during those days. We have a speed called the cut in speed, which is when those blades will start spinning. And that ends up being three meters per second or about seven miles per hour. So unfortunately, we don't produce energy on those days. We keep them off and not moving to essentially keep the health of the blades um, as high as possible. Great. Um, Lauren wants to know, are some turbines more powerful than others? Um, or in other words, has the design improved over time? Yeah, so some turbines do produce more power than other turbines, um, but it can depend on what your specific project wants. Some projects don't want uh, 1.5 megawatts. They might want in the kilowatt range, um, but all the projects that we handle end up in the megawatt range. So on one hand, uh, turbines have gotten a higher maximum in the power they produce, but there is also a wide range of what consumers do want. All right, we're going to combine a couple uh, questions here. So Neil wants to know what's the life cycle of a turbine, and then also um, Dorsey wants to know how much money one turbine would cost. Okay, so one turbine I can answer can cost about three million dollars if you were to buy it outright. Uh, so a little too expensive for me personally. Um, quite a bit of money, and the life cycle of a turbine is actually quite long, uh, especially from our perspective because we do all the planning as well. So for us, it looks like planning out that project, finding a good area to put it, making sure the wind is high enough that it'll be spinning frequently, and then actually doing the construction process of building it up, um, building the foundation, then all the tower, and then uh, flying the rotor, as I brought up before. There's also many, many more smaller steps in there that would take probably years to get into all the details of. So it's a pretty long life cycle even to build one up. Okay, great. Um... Sherry Shaver wants to know what are all of kind of those warning signs in the background that we're seeing behind you? Could you talk a little bit about a couple of those? Yeah, so some warning signs back here are pretty obvious, like no smoking. We don't want any smoking in our turbines. Uh, we do have protective shoe wear. So we have a lot of PPE that, require, that we require our technicians to wear. So right now I'm actually in steel-toed boots. We have helmets that we require to wear on all climbs, no matter how long. We have things called LAD safes, which help us with that cabling on the wire. That's uh, required for any amount of time. Um, we have lights as well on our helmets, just in case it were to be dark in any section. Uh, so that's what a lot of these signs are. And then a lot of the ones over here on the converter cabinets are just talking about the high voltage of electricity going through them. So we try to you know, make sure everybody has plenty of warning before we uh, open these cabinets. Um, we also don't open them when there is electricity flowing through them. We will make sure they're in a safe, um, basically a maintenance mode before we do that. Okay, great. Okay, so we're gonna pause our questions now so that we can get to the rest of our tour here. Um, so as we're going to leave the turbine and the inside, so thank you, Duncan, and he is going to venture out to the nacelle. Um, and but while he does that, we're gonna check in with Justin, who is another One Energy technician. Hi, my name is Justin. 
uh, technician here at One Energy, and day-to-day uh, -day on a project, uh, we do everything from you know running the high voltage power at the grid all the way to the turbine, to all the communication cables in between, being able to access them remotely. Um, we do the connections in the basement of the turbine. We do connections in the top of the turbine. So basically every part of the electrical system from the grid to the top of the turbine and then all the communications in between on a day to day on the electrical site. With safety precautions with the electrical and with working at the heights. So we're tied off 100% of the time. We've got two lanyards to be able to stay tied off 100% of the time. We have a uh, lad safe that hooks up to our chest. There's a wire rope that goes all the way up. I mean, if you would drop, you know, not even six inches, it's gonna catch you uh, on the way down. Um, and then getting on and off ladder, always tying off with one of your lanyards. Um, to go anywhere outside of the nacelle, you're gonna be tied off. Uh, we turn the turbine into service mode so that it cannot be an operational. We do a lockout, tag out on everything on that. So there's no risk, uh, as in the turbine starting up when we're up, up there, there's no way for anyone else to access it even remotely. Um, once we put it in service mode and lock and tag out, we're, uh, we're safe there. There are some uh, live components still. We still have uh, some auxiliary power so where we can actually yaw the turbine and pitch the blades to be able to lock out while we're up there so we can actually go into the rotor. And then as well as some electrical for lights and odds and ends for that, for uh, tools and whatnot that we do need. Most of our tooling in these turbines is all air equipment. We have an airline that runs all the way up. And then all of our electrical equipment, we all have ways to ground everything out um, nice and safely. Um, we try to turn everything off remotely so we can actually log in and uh, remotely turn everything off, create less of an arc flash hazard. Um, we also have some push buttons located outside, uh, you know, like 50 feet away from areas. Um, so really, we try to really minimize all of our arc flash potentials so that we don't have those risks. For my training, uh, I went through a five-year apprenticeship through a local union, and I did that with electrical. So I basically worked during the day, went to school, you know, for like three hours, two, day, uh, two nights a week, and did that for five years. Um, and then basically every year of schooling ended with so many work hours, you basically just increase your pay um, every year and until you eventually top out, you get your journeyman's license and then, you know, you still can do, uh, usually most unions still put on, you know, continued education classes every year. But uh, that's just a good way to, you know, learn a skilled trade that anymore is kind of lacking the manpower or, you know, the women as well, I guess. Um, but, you know, there's plenty of room for that. And anymore, the wages are very similar to a four-year degree, if not almost above in the trade schooling uh, way. So. All right, great. So we are excited to see the interior of the nacelle here where Duncan is. Um, so Duncan, tell us what the nacelle does, um, what are its functions and some, some facts and info about that, and then we will take some more questions. Yeah, so the nacelle is actually the area on the back of a turbine. If you see driving along the road, they look a little boxy. Um, ours almost look like golf balls. Um, and they are the first thing that you'll see when you're climbing up the ladder. Um, so they hold a lot of different stuff that control the uh, top of the tower. So we have some more converter cabinets up top, and then we even have some controls for our pitch gears and our yaw gears. Uh, you can actually see some of those yaw gear motors to our left there in blue. There's one there, and there's actually two in the back of the nacelle as well. Um, so as I said, these things are flown all the way up uh, for the rotor. And yeah, they're really the first thing you see when you climb all the way to the top. Um, so Duncan, if you could take us through how we make, um, how we use the make it into energy. Um, could you take us through simple steps if we were, you know, not familiar with a wind turbine? We have a few questions about that. Yeah. So turbines convert wind to energy by essentially spinning the rotor. Um, so what happens is the wind will hit the blades um, and that will create essentially a force on those blades that starts to spin them. As they're spinning in our turbines, they're spinning something called a permanent direct drive magnet motor. 
um, which is essentially just a big magnet spinning around a wire, and that produces electricity. Um, some different turbines will use gearbox motors. Ours are, as I said, basically just big magnets. As that magnet spins, as I said, it produces electricity out those wires. We take that electricity, transform it into a more usable form, and then give it to our customers. Um, so to summarize, wind spins the blade, blade spins a magnet, and then the electricity comes out. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and then what are some environmental concerns on a wind farm? Um, Douglas has a question about this. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So we always cite with these environmental concerns in mind, we cite away from wetlands, which are usually protected land areas. We cite away from migratory bird paths as well. Uh, those are both pretty common practices in the wind industry um, and things that we obviously take into account. Uh, we take into account all sorts of other uh, siting as well, things like how near we are to power lines and things like that. Um, so lots of siting stuff. We avoid basically as much environmental damage as possible though, really all if we can, um, because what we're trying to do at the end of the day is produce green electricity. Right, great. Um, speaking of the birds, I think a lot of people think that um, these birds are harmed by wind turbines, but can you dispel this this fact? Yeah, so uh, a lot of people do think that birds are uh, killed by wind turbines, and that does happen. Um, it's an unavoidable fact, but buildings also kill wind turbines, cars kill wind turbines, uh, or cars kill birds, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, <laughs> So uh, bird take is a pretty common thing to happen. Turbines are not the only um, destructive force there. And while we do, as I say, avoid that as much as possible, it is going to happen a little bit. Right. Um, Marquia wants to know what part of your job do you like the most? Ooh, what part of my job do I like the most? I like the days where I'm inside half the day and outside half the day. Um, so perfect example is that is today. Today, half the day, I'm giving a tour to you guys, um, going around our yard, showing you guys all about turbines and one energy. And then the other half of my day, I'm inside dealing with data. Um, so it's this really nice balance for me to be able to do both of those things. Uh, other days, I'll spend half the day doing inspections on the turbines, and then the other half of the day inside designing a new uh, system for our office. Um, so it's a really cool balance that I get to have in that. Awesome. All right, we have a question from Olivia. Um, at what wind speed do you need to turn off the turbines? Yeah, so we turn off the turbines at 22 meters per second, which is about 50 miles per hour. Uh, so the wind's going pretty fast at that point. Uh, and then much above that, we make sure to definitely be cut off. Okay. And Lauren wants to know, what do you do with the turbines during a heavy snow? Uh, during a heavy snow, um, it depends. Um, there is a possibility of us turning them off then, um, just to make sure there's essentially no snow being flung from the blades. So trying to avoid any sort of... Um, effects that that might have on the surrounding area. Okay. Um, Patricia wants to know how much of the energy in Ohio comes from wind turbines? I'm sorry, Kelsey, could you repeat that? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Patricia wanted to know if you could tell us anything about how much of the energy in Ohio comes from wind turbines. Ooh, unfortunately, I can't say how much of the energy in Ohio comes from turbines. Um, so our turbines specifically power certain uh, factories, certain uh, uh, customers that we have. Uh, some other turbines in Ohio will go straight to the grid to be used by everyday consumers like houses and smaller offices, things like that. Um, but because of how how and where we build turbines, I can't say how much of Ohio is powered by wind. Right. And how many um, companies are you powering with your turbines? Oh, how many companies? Uh, so we power a couple of Whirlpool plants. We power a couple of marathon plants we power a plant called valve film here in Findlay, another one called ball um and yeah that's about it okay great thank you um we would like to know how if a turbine has ever been damaged a blade or a turbine has ever fallen off we have a couple of questions about that um damages from christine and diana uh, yeah, so damage is going to be handled differently depending on where it is. Um, we actually have protections against damages on our blade. We have something called the leading edge protection. Um, so that side of the blade that's swinging into the wind really fast actually has a special material coated on it um, to prevent any damage happening from there. Um, and if that special coating does get damaged, we can replace that uh, pretty easily with another coating, essentially, which keeps the actual blade itself super, super healthy. Um, but that's really the primary part of the blade that would experience any damage because it is the part that's swinging as, at, as I said, like 150 miles per hour. Okay, great. Um, all right, so we are going to um, 
transition to a couple of other videos. So thank you for showing us that, Duncan. Um, and before we take some okay. final questions, we're going to hear from our last two energy employees, Nate and Carrie. Uh, I'm Nate Fisher. I'm a field engineer intern at One Energy. I'm a junior mechanical engineering student at the University of Toledo, and I graduated from Lake High School. Uh, at One Energy, I rotate between different programs. Uh, we have multiple different departments, and interns will rotate on a weekly basis, and we'll participate in whatever tasks uh, they have for us. We do a lot of wind analysis with our PPT group. Uh, with the construction crew, we'll get out on the field and actually do work with our equipment. Uh, we rotate into our storytelling group. We get to look at the marketing side. Um, we work with accounting. Uh, I was not really set on what I wanted to do in college, so I was good at math. I knew other people in the program at UT, so I decided I'd go into that. Uh, at first, it was just I knew I wanted to go to college, so I just was working my way through it. And getting more of an idea of what I wanted to do with the degree was, since I've been working here, I've gotten more experience in the field, get more understanding of what my options are, what I can do with it. Try different things, like a lot of internships. I didn't do an internship until my sophomore year of uh, college, just kind of followed the program that I was given. Uh, the more experiences you have in different fields, get an idea of what you can do with your career. I didn't even start working a uh, job until I graduated high school, so get experience in what your other options are, see, you know, do I want to go to college, do I want to go to some place right out of high school? So, yeah, getting job experience earlier. Hi, my name is Carrie Gaines. I'm a technician here at One Energy. Um, I guess Daily responsibilities here, it can vary from day to day, whether we're in a project or not. When we're not doing a project, we do a lot of maintenance on the turbines, um, climbing up and checking just to make sure everything's clean and looks good. We do maintenance on equipment and just kind of clean up the yard and make sure everything's organized and in good shape. So doing maintenance, we typically climb every turbine in our fleet um, twice a year to check out things and we will stop deck to deck. We check out the bolts, like I said, make sure everything's a good connection, uh, make sure everything's clean, deck lights work, things like that. When you get up to the nacelle, that's when we check a lot of the power boxes, a lot of the cables, make sure those connections are good. And we actually go into the hub, which is the front nose cone and check for clean, cleanliness and connections and stuff like that in there. So it actually, when we do maintenance on a turbine, it'll take us a good hour and a half, two hours to just check out everything. All of my training for what I do has been through One Energy. I didn't really have, I had some general construction knowledge just from life, but um, as far as a lot of the electrical work that I do, that was on the job training. Um, climbing the turbines on the job training. They also train us in tower rescue, um, which is actually kind of a fun class. We do that here on site. We do EMT training on site. Um, a lot of equipment operating, we do that here also. So like I said, in my experience, everything that I do here, I've been trained on here. Um, being a woman in this industry can be very interesting. Um, I've been really fortunate to work with guys who respect me as a woman and respect that I can do things, maybe not lift the, you know, 100 pound things, but I can do a lot of things just like they can. Um, so it's just, you know, just be ready for the here and there comments that you might get. But for the most part, it's been great. You get a lot of respect. You get to learn a lot of different things and just kind of get your hands dirty. So it's a good experience anyone can do it. There are really so many opportunities here. There are so many areas. If you're interested in operating equipment, you could be on the civil team, uh, run a bulldozer, run an excavator, operate a forklift. Um, if electrical is your thing, you can be on the electrical team and we do a lot of high voltage, medium voltage, um, just a whole lot of different things that you can learn. There's a, a lot of things that you can get your hands on here. 
Um, we also have the erection team who actually stacks the towers. They run the crane. They call the crane with signals. Um, they do a lot of the a lot of the big kind of exciting stuff. So, like I said, there's just there's so many opportunities. So many opportunities here. All right, awesome. Uh, great to learn about all the opportunities in the wind industry. Um, so we are almost out of time, but we do have a few extra minutes for questions. Um, so we are going to hand it over to Duncan. Duncan, I'm just gonna try to get through as many as I can. Um, and I think he's there, let's see. There he is. Okay, so Duncan, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right. So All right. like I said, we just have a couple of minutes for um, some extra questions. You can see he is still outside. Um, you have a really great view of the turbines there. It looks like it's a pretty nice day. Um, so we want to know, are the blades sharp? Patricia would like to know if the blades are sharp. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, the blades are not that sharp. Uh, I can actually put my hand along that leading edge of the blade that I was talking about before, and it won't it won't hurt me at all. I can run my hand along it. It's actually pretty smooth from a uh, from a human perspective. I will also add real quick too. Uh, Whirlpool has two turbines at the North Finley Wind Campus. I said three before. That's my mistake. And we found the the foundation goes anywhere between seven and eight feet in the ground. Uh, that'll yeah. depend on a bunch of civil engineering factors. But to answer that question, it's between seven and eight feet. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, and could you no repeat problem. for us, we have a couple of people who would like it repeated, how long the blades are and how much they weigh and what they are made of. So yeah. how long are they? <laughs> yeah. So the blades are 150 feet long about, uh, so they're quite long. Um, we can have about 19 kids do this along the blades and uh, they'll go from about tip to base. Uh, in terms of weight, they're about uh, 18,000 pounds each. Um, so they're pretty heavy. Um, and then final question what they're made of is uh, yes. fiberglass and balsa wood are the primary two materials which allows them to be very very light but also very very flexible great okay thank you and then we also wanted um to repeat how much power does one turbine make yeah so our turbines produce 1.5 megawatts of power um at their rated speed so at their max power generation they'll produce 1.5 megawatts different for different turbines but the ones that we have here at north finley wind campus 1.5 megawatts um, we also have a couple of questions from Patricia and Sherry about, do you know anything about when the first turbine was invented? Um, I can't say I do, unfortunately. I don't know much about the first turbine invention. Um, we can find that out, but uh, unfortunately, I don't off the top of my head. No problem. There's always something to learn, right? Um, and yeah, exactly. <laughs> what is the most, um, from the Biomed Academy, what's the most common damage that happens to the turbine? Uh, so the most common damage to the turbine is that uh, leading edge damage that I talked about before. Um, those blades are spinning so fast and usually for so long, uh, meaning like, you know, multiple hours every day um, in such a high intensity environment that uh, they're the things that are going to see damage. Now, we do have that leading edge protection, as we said, really easy to change that out so we don't have to go out and change an entire blade. Um, that protection will keep the blade healthy and also keep the aerodynamics as smooth as possible. Great. All right. Um... Our final, we have time for just a couple more. Um, we want to know a little bit about One Energy as a company, um, how old the company is, and um, how long have the turbines been on the premises? Yeah, so uh, One Energy has been around for about a decade at this point, um, so almost 10 years, so Oh, much more time than I've been here, obviously, uh, about seven months. And the turbines have been on campus for actually varying amounts of times. Uh, these first two, these two Whirlpool ones that I mentioned, and then the next three ones for the ball plant have been on site uh, for less time than the next three ball ones that you'll see. Um, so they've been on uh, for essentially different amounts of years. Great. And we have one more question. Our final question is going to be from Christina. Um, All right. She wants to know if you can help students understand how much energy a megawatt is. Yeah, so uh, a megawatt is uh, quite a bit of power. Um, basically, if you spin one of our turbines for about a year or for a year, they'll power about 300 to 400 homes. Um, so if that offers a little bit of perspective there, um, hopefully that's a little helpful. Yeah, great. Yeah. All right, awesome. Well, it is 145 um, and we don't want to keep anybody over time. So um, we want to thank all of our classrooms for participating in our virtual field trip today. 
And we especially want to thank Duncan and One Energy for hosting our field trip. It was so exciting to be with you. And we always enjoy learning about wind turbines and the wind energy industry. Um, if you are interested in a recording of today's trip, that will be available on Ohio Energy Project's YouTube channel. And we would love to see all of you at our next virtual field trip on November 17th we are gonna be looking at careers in the solar industry. So thank you again, Duncan, and everybody who participated today. Um, have a great day and we will see you next time.